Thanks, Frank. Let's let's talk about a specific patient. Marsha, can you uh, think of a patient from uh, your sure, clinic that sure. uh, we can discuss? Sure. So um, I can remember right now uh, a 35-year-old, actually, who was originally diagnosed with, with papillary thyroid cancer, had surgery, had a couple of lymph nodes, radioactive iodine, and was followed and for a while thyroid globulins were zero and, and did very, very well. However, about eight years later, developed multiple pulmonary mets as well as bulky disease in the neck. And uh, because of some of the issues that Gary brought up and there was concern about what would happen with the trachea, airway, and swallowing issues, she did have some of that reduced in her neck. But the, um, then she was actually seen by the endocrinologist who did a, a whole body scan because we didn't know, remember, she'd had one or two rounds of radioactive iodine 10 years earlier, but the new disease, these small pulmonary mets, may have still been radioactive iodine responsive. So just because they grew after having it, you can't assume anything. So they were um, studied, given a dose, sometimes empiric, sometimes a diagnostic dose, and, and we evaluated it. Well, clearly, actually, all the lung nodules did not take up radioactive iodine at that point. But now we're still in that situation where I don't know at the pace of the disease because it had been about eight years. So we studied it and about uh, th with every three-month scans, and we really saw quite a bit of growth, actually, between the three-month scans. And after the third one, the nice thing about it is that since we kind of were following her, she wasn't in any danger. We luckily, at the time, once the neck had been taken care of, there weren't any lesions that were in the high-risk areas mm -hmm. that, that Manisha talked about. And then we start to make the discussion, well, you need to start probably in the next three to six months. And the lovely thing is we actually, because we didn't have any risk factors, we had a family wedding, we had a couple of graduations we wanted to get through, and this person loved the summer. And so we said, okay, so come September, we started the, the therapy, and when they had the hand-foot syndrome, they weren't playing golf. So, you know, some of these things, you know, the nice thing is that if you do know the patient, again, if we, we can do that, uh, it, you can merge the, um, the toxicities and, and work with it. And so she did very well and, and has been, been uh, she was on actually for three years with a really great response. What, what drug did you start her on? That was serafinib. That was serafinib. Yeah. Nefa, do you start this patient on, on TKI? Yes. Um, so the patient that's radioactive iodine refractory that is showing progressive disease over, you said, three to six month um, mm -hmm. period, um, that is somebody that we would um, start on, on tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Um, Gary, that's right. I want to make a point. This is an unusual patient. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, so a, a young woman that presents in her 30s with local regional disease um, is not the common patient that we're talking about at this time. Uh, so it's a good exemplary patient that had progressive distant disease and local regional control, but this is not the run-of-the-mill 30-year-old woman. No. Uh, most of them will be. Most of them do very well. Yeah. Most is, is of them the, yeah, do very, very well. Right, absolutely. Um, and she I gets, think... Go I'm sorry, ahead. just a quick comment, um, you know, on what Marcia said in terms of making sure that they truly are radioactive iodine refractory is very important. This is a young patient. Most of them do take up radioactive iodine, even though they have distant metastases in the lung. And even whether the patient's referred to you and you're not sure, you, you know, you should take a look at the whole body scans yourself, make sure they didn't get recent contrast or other interfering things. And if you're not sure, just repeat a diagnostic whole body scan. But it's very important that we don't deem people radioactive iodine non-refractory, give them these therapies that affect their quality of life when and they it, don't need it. It might be actually, I, I think you've been part of these discussions too, Naifa, where we might be changing a little bit of how the radioactive iodine is done. Because historically, many times we get a patient who's had radioactive iodine, there was no uptake, but we had no idea whether there's any disease there that was non-avid. Mm -hmm. And there was never any cross-sectional imaging. And so what we really are putting, putting forward, and we even wrote a review to actually to, to address this issue is that more and more, especially people have very positive biomarkers, they're being studied with radioactive iodine, mm -hmm. that following the radioactive iodine, you get a contrast enhanced CT. You can do the contrast enhancement only after the radioactive iodine because the contrast itself, we all know, will block the uptake of iodine. So you can't do it before, but you're also never going to give radioactive iodine two times in a three-month period. So you really, there's no reason not to do it afterwards, and that allows me to have the data. Because so many times the problem I have is I have a patient referred to me, now they have radioactive iodine disease, but no one ever actually looked at the cross-sectional imaging. So I think we need to change a little bit the way we practice things, especially in these high-risk patients that, you know, in the endocrine world where they're, where they're having positive, um, very positive markers and negative whole body scans. We need to make it a routine that we're doing the cross-sectional yeah. imaging. You, you, need, you need that information we to do. make the future decisions. This patient of yours...